phone so am i audible so let us start with the chat hopefully my internet will hold on so this is a very beautiful chant uh, this original is in sanskrit by adi shankaracharya and uh, which master had uh, recited when he took monkhood from his guru Sri Yukteswar, and when he came to the U.S., he uh, translated his this chant into English. So this is coming very strongly. So let us chant together. Oh, no, 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 no. 
keeping this affirmation very strongly gazing up at the point between the eyebrows i am here i am here blessed spirit i am here there is nothing that we are that belongs to this world that we need to identify with This is a very beautiful chant to practice non-attachment to anything that we are at the moment very strongly attached to. So uh, we are slowly moving towards the, the chapter where we will be meeting Master. And Swamiji has been going through various um, stages of rather, you know, uh, neti neti, neither this nor that. So he is experimenting with a lot of things. He is intuitively uh, understanding a lot of things, but on a very intellectual level, right? So he understands that, you know, affirmations work a lot. He understands that, you know, expect luck and meet it halfway, which are very spiritual, with yogic principles. But there is nobody to uh, tell him that this is what it is. So he is coming to his own conclusion. And in that conclusion, uh, it, is, it is coming more. He thinks, you know, he's, he's thinking. He's thinking a lot. He says, I'm thinking, thinking. Uh, even God, I'm thinking about God rather than uh, communing with God because there was no guidance, right? So on his own, as we discussed last class that, you know, it was he is uh, following Shankya philosophy, which says, neti neti, neither this, neither that. Why we, why we need to get away from this world? This, I don't belong. But then he doesn't know. And he also knows that goal is God. But he doesn't know what does God mean really. So he is again thinking his own thing. So God must mean this. He, he, I am conscious. So probably God is conscious too. In that he is concluding. And, uh, but he doesn't know how to reach there. right? Mm -hmm. So we are still in that process. So let us listen to Swamiji reading this chapter. And then we will discuss it. Intellectual Traps An ancient Greek myth relates that Icarus and his father Daedalus escaped from Crete on artificial wings fashioned by Daedalus out of wax and feathers. Icarus, growing overconfident in his joy of flying, ignored his father's advice not to soar too high. As he approached nearer and nearer to the sun, the wax on his wings melted and Icarus plunged to his death in what has been known ever since as the Icarian Sea. Many of the old Greek myths contain deep psychological and spiritual truths. In this story, we find symbolized one of man's all too frequent mistakes. In his joy at discovering within himself some hitherto unsuspected power, he flies too high ignoring the advice of those who have learned from experience to value humility. I had discovered that by willpower, faith, and sensitive attunement to certain things I wanted to accomplish, I could turn the tide of events to some degree in my favor. I could learn new languages and speak them adequately in as short a time as a week. This discovery was one, of course, that I made over a period of time as I traveled around the world. 
I could choose to be well and I was well. I could walk confidently toward certain of life's closed doors and they opened for me. In all these little successes there had been two key words, sensitivity and attunement. In learning Greek I had tried to attune myself sensitively to the Greek consciousness. The operative principle had been not my mere resolution to learn the language, but my inner attempt to tune into it. In the affirmation, I'm a Greek, Greek, not I, had been the key word. Now, however, in my youthful exuberance, I fairly flung myself into the breach. Partly, indeed, I was moved to enthusiasm by the sheer grandeur of my new insights. But because my enthusiasm was excessive, sensitivity and attunement often got lost in the dust kicked up by my overly affirmative ego. I wanted wisdom, where well, very well then I was wise. I wanted what I wrote to inspire and guide people. I wanted to be a great writer, very well then I was a great writer. And if they weren't inspired, it was their problem. How very simple. All I had to do was, some fine day, produce the poems, plays, and novels that would demonstrate what was already, as far as I was concerned, a fait accompli. The idea probably had a certain merit, but it was marred by the fact that I was reaching too far beyond my present realities. In the strain involved there was tension, and in the tension, ego. Faith, if exerted too far beyond a person's actual abilities, becomes presumption. It is best above all to submit positive affirmations to the whispered higher guidance of the soul. Knowing nothing of such guidance, however, I supplied my own. That which I decreed to be wisdom was wisdom. That which I decreed to be greatness was greatness. It was not that my opinions were foolish. Many of them were, I think, basically sound. But their scope was circumscribed by my pride. There was no room here for others' opinions. I had not yet learned to listen sensitively to that truth which comes out of the mouths of babes. At the same time, I expected ready agreement with my opinions, even from those whose age and experience of life gave them some right to consider me a babe. I would be no man's disciple. I would blaze my own trails. By vigorous mental affirmation, I would bend destiny itself to my will. Well, I was not the first young man, nor would I be the last, who imagined the pop gun in his hand to be a cannon. At least my developing views on life were such that, in time, they refuted my very arrogance. For my junior year, I transferred to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. New perceptions would flourish better, I felt, in a new environment. At Brown, I continued my major in English literature and took additional courses in art appreciation, philosophy, and, since a science course was required, geology. My attitude toward formal education, however, was becoming increasingly cavalier. I didn't see that a college degree would be of any possible use to me in my chosen career as a writer. Nor did I have much patience with an accumulation of mere facts when it was the why of things that interested me. Even our philosophy course, which ought to have been at least relatively concerned with the whys, was devoted to categorizing the mere opinions of those whose works we were studying. When I found I wasn't expected to preoccupy myself with the validity of their opinions, I took to reading poetry in silent protest in the classroom. Intent on developing the identity I had selected for myself, I played the role, for all who cared to listen to me, of successful author and philosopher. A few people actually did listen, for hours we sat together, engrossed in the adventure of philosophical thinking. I got my friends to see that joy has to be the real purpose of life, that non-attachment is the surest key to joy, and that a person ought to live simply seeking joy not in things, 
but in an ever-expanding vision of reality. Truth, I insisted, can be found not in the sordid aspects of life, as so many writers of the day claimed, but in the heights of human aspiration. Most of the writing of my student days has long since been consigned to fire and blessed oblivion. One piece that escaped the Holocaust, however, expresses some of the views I was expounding at that time. It may serve a useful purpose for me to quote it here, unedited, for I still consider its teaching valid. My countrymen, having begotten what is in many respects a monstrosity, go about saying what has never before been said so strongly, that we must go with the age if we would create great things that it is necessary for them to repeat what should be normally too obvious for repetition, shows how slight is the hold this century has on our hearts. They have, moreover, misunderstood the true meaning of democracy, which is not, as they suppose, to debase the nobleman while singing the virtues of the common man, but rather to tell the common man that he too can now become noble. The object of democracy is to raise the lowly, and not to praise them for being low. It is only with such a goal that it can have any real merit. God's law is right and beautiful. No ugliness exists except man's injustice and the symbols of it. It is not life in the raw we see when we pass through the slums, not the naked truth that many so-called realists would have us see, but the facts and figures of our injustice the distortion of life and the corruption of truth. If we would claim to be realistic, it is not reality we shall see from the squalid depths of humanity, for our view will be premised on injustice and negation. Goodness and beauty will appear bizarre, whereas misery, hatred, and all the sad children of man's misunderstanding will seem normal, and yet strange withal and unfounded as if one could see the separate leaves and branches of a tree, and yet could find no trunk. It is not from the hovel of a pauper that we can see all truth, but from the dwelling place of a saint. For from his mountain, ugliness itself is seen not as darkness, but as lack of light. And the squalor of cities will be no longer foreign, but a native wrong, understood at the core as a symptom of our own injustice. The more closely we watch the outside as a means of understanding the inside, the farther off the inside withdraws from our understanding. The same with people as with God. My ideas were, I think, as I've already said, basically valid. Ideas alone, however, do not constitute wisdom. Truth must be lived. I'm afraid that in endless discussions about truth, the sweet taste of it still eluded me. One day a friend and I were crossing campus on our way back from class. Lovingly he turned to me and remarked, if ever I've met a genius in my life, it is you. For a moment I felt flattered by his words, but then as I reflected on them, shame swept over me like a wave. What had I actually done to deserve my friend's praise. I had talked. I had been so busy talking that I hadn't even had much time left over for writing, and his compliment had been sincere. It was one thing to have played the part of author and philosopher to convince myself. It was quite another for my act to have convinced others. I felt I had been a hypocrite. Sick with self-disappointment, I was withdrew thenceforth from most of my associates at Brown, and sought to express in writing the truths I had hitherto been treating lightly as coffee shop conversation. It didn't take me very long to realize that it is much easier to talk, hit or miss philosophy over a coffee table than to transform basic concepts into meaningful writing or living. There are levels of understanding which come only when one has lived a truth deeply for years. Initial insights may suggest almost the same words. 
Yet the power of those words will be as nothing compared to the conviction that rings through them when their truths have been deeply lived. Saint Anthony, in the early part of the Christian era, was called from his desert retreat by the Bishop of Alexandria to speak in defense of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Arguments had been raging throughout Christendom in consequence of the so-called Arian heresy, which denied Christ's oneness with God. Saint Anthony gave no long, carefully reasoned homily in defense of his theme. His words, however, were charged with the fervor of a lifetime spent in prayer and meditation and conveyed such deep power that among those who heard him that day, all further argument ceased. What St. Anthony said was, I have seen him. Alas, I had not seen him, nor had I deeply lived a single truth. The words I painted on my verbal canvas were more sketches than finished works. Try as I would to express my ideas in writing, the moment I picked up a pen, I found my mind becoming vague and uncertain. Whatever I did write was more to develop my literary technique than to express what was really in my heart to say. I described situations with which I wasn't personally familiar. I wrote about people whose living counterparts I had never met. To master my craft, I imitated the styles of others, hoping to find in their phrasing and choice of words, secrets of clarity and beauty that I might later develop into a style of my own. I had the satisfaction of being praised by certain professors and professional men of letters. Some of them told me they expected me someday to become a front-ranking novelist or playwright. At 19, however, I was far from justifying their kindly expectations. Worst of all, in my own opinion, was the fact that I was saying almost nothing really worth saying. I worked on the psychological effects in poetry of different patterns of rhyme and rhythm. I studied the emotion-charged rhythms of the Irish English, which the great Irish playwright, John Millington Singh, had captured so beautifully. I wondered why modern English was, by comparison, so lacking in deep feeling. I pondered how, without sounding studied and unnatural, I might bring beauty to dramatic speech. One of the dogmas I had been taught in English class was that iambic pentameter, the blank verse form of Shakespeare, is the most natural rhythm for poetic speech in the English language. Shakespeare, of course, was trotted out as the ultimate justification for this dogma. But in modern English, Blank verse sounded to me much too courtly. Maxwell Anderson, the 20th century American playwright, used it in several of his plays, and the best I could say of them was that they were brave attempts. I certainly didn't want to confine myself to the sterile formula modern writers so often followed in trying to render speech realistically. You want to come? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, look, I'm not begging you. Just take it or leave it. Okay, okay, smart boy. Who says I don't want to come? Shakespeare, even when imitating common speech, idealized it. My problem was how to follow his example without sounding artificial. If literary language couldn't uplift, there seemed little point in calling it literature. And if dramatic writing couldn't inspire, why give back to people a mere echo of the way they spoke already? For my summer vacation in 1946, I went to Provincetown on Cape Cod, a haven for artists and writers. There I rented a small room, made an upside-down dresser drawer serve as a desk, and devoted myself to writing a one-act play. To make the few dollars I had stretch as far as possible, I ate the chef's special every day for lunch at a local diner. For 45 cents, I got a greasy beef stew with one or two soggy slices of potato in it, and if I was lucky, a sagging piece of carrot. After two months of this daily banquet, even that bargain price could no longer tempt me to endure such punishment another day. 
I went into the diner one afternoon, ordered the chef's special, watched a slice of potato disintegrate as I stabbed at it half-heartedly with a spoon, then got up and walked out again, never to return. Toward the end of summer, I spent a week on a distant beach, far from the madding crowd. How wonderful it would be, I thought, really to be a hermit. My one-act play, which I finished on those dunes, didn't turn out badly, though I hadn't been able to shake off the hypnotic charm of Singh's English. The summer itself was pleasant also, despite my penury. But above all, what it did was show me that I was as much an outsider in artistic circles as in any other. Increasingly, it was becoming clear that I would never find what I was seeking by becoming anything. To say I'm a writer, or even I'm a great writer, wasn't at all the answer. What I needed above all concerned the deeper question of what I was already. Yeah. So, this is the uh, interesting uh, that story that he talks about is Greek, where you know, uh, Master always used to say that uh, they, you know, when Swamiji, I mean, later on it will come when uh, Swamiji was thinking about him, like you know, he was right there, but just thinking about how great he was, uh, the Guru Master came up to him and said just a bulge in the ocean. That's it. These masters, they don't, the ego is like, you know, they just take an ego just to, so as to function in this world. Their ego is not like us, me, I, me, that separateness is not there, right? And uh, that is where, what he's talking about in this, that uh, when the wave, master used to say, when it, the higher the wave, the more it crashes that badly, right? And that is what he says, that, uh, People who are experienced, they always say, we tell people that uh, don't fly too high. But those who are, you know, uh, very egoistic or they think they are very, they know it all, tend to do that. And then the crash is equally bad. And that is what happened to Icarus also, right? That uh, it's just an allegorical story, but that's what it says, that he flew too high uh, despite the warnings and he fell to his death. So he's again, he's saying, I had discovered that my willpower, faith, and sensitive attunement to certain things I wanted to accomplish, I could turn the tide of events to some degree in my favor. Now, this, um, he is coming to it again and again sensitivity and attunement. I could choose to be well, and I was well. So, whatever he wanted, he could. And this is again, you know, an, a yogic principle or this is the truth. This is how it is where we saw an autobiography of a yogi where uh, Lahiri Masha and Sri Yukteswar. Sri Yukteswar was, you know, training under Lahiri Masha and he says, I'm, I know I was not well and I'm very thin. I lost a lot of weight. And uh, Lahiri Masha initially was making fun of him, like, you know, telling him, oh, you are, maybe tomorrow you'll be fine. And he actually starts feeling very fine. And then he says, oh, you're feeling fine. You invigorate yourself. Maybe tomorrow, uh, who knows how it's going to be. And so it so happens that next day he is actually not able to drag himself to the uh, to Lahiri Masha's house. And then Lahiri Masha says that, you know, your mind is very, uh, we are made in the image of God, right? So our minds are have the potential that whatever we think very intensely will come to pass. So our thoughts are, you know, uh, very, very, uh, they, they they can manifest whatever we are thinking very strongly. And here Swamiji is saying he, he understood it on a very intellectual level, yes, but he understood that I could choose to be well and I was well. I could walk for, towards certain certain of life's closed door and they opened for me. So he what what was the uh, trick was the willpower, sensitivity, attunement, and faith that he can do it, right? He says in learning Greek, so again, you know, that, that non-attachment also. He says in learning Greek, I try to attune myself sensitively on the Greek consciousness. How does a Greek, if, you know, I were to understand Greek, how would a Greek man uh, be like? You know, so he is getting 
he went try to get into that consciousness of how a greek person will uh, function or think in that and that is how it tuned into the greek consciousness and he saying when i would say i am a greek so the, the key word is greek not i the more we move away from who i am ego is something that you know holds on right it it tries to hold so then we become i me myself so there is a tension in that we are which we are not able to let go I mean, even in patanjali when he talks of yam niyam so non attachment uh, when he talks about that it is like you know he, he says that somebody who has perfected that uh, so non attachment is like you know not even being uh, not non possessiveness non aparigraha which means that even if what what you have not being even attached to that so somebody who has perfected that uh, you know he he is able to remember his past lives that is because uh, or do i need to pin myself up so somebody who is uh, able to uh, do perfect that is able to uh, because he then loses that that hold on this body this incarnation no so that ego so he is able to go beyond that and he remembers his past life right and that is what he says that the soul knows it all so uh, if i want to learn greek or you know he says i i get into the greek consciousness that is possible only when there is a detachment from who i am so that is why he says greek is the keyword not i right so uh, so he is understanding a lot of things and that kind of you know intellectual he is understanding in a very intellectual way there is no guidance so then it's kind of uh, you know gets into an affirmative ego the ego comes in and says i know it all i if i say i am wise i am wise if i say i know it all i know it all so he is moving in that a very superficial way so he says if i say i am a very good writer i am a great writer if people don't understand that's their problem uh, so not really tuning into what people want to read or what inspires them because i think you know the, I, what i write is very inspiring so i write so uh, the same swami ji uh, later on in one of his talks when once he had met his master guru and all very i mean uh, when he had ananda lord he said that uh, when he would go to any place uh, Uh, to give a talk he said i would tune into uh, what do they want to hear from me today you know because diff- there are different kinds of people each would have a different thought or what they are seeking or what they are dealing with so he would try to very sensitively tune into what does this audience want to listen from me so that is that is very important and he said invariably what he then uh, he would have prepared something and gone but what would come out was very different sometimes because uh, that is what the audience needed and many people would later come and say that you know i had this question and you answered me uh, during your talk that was because he was sensitively tuning into what they want and uh, but at this stage he says that i am a writer i am a great writer you don't understand it's your problem so how very simple all i had to do was uh some fine day produce a poems plays novels and you know that's it i i have accomplished um and he says the idea probably had a certain merit because here it says that he learned greek in a week so it did have that help for him but he said i was reaching far to beyond my present realities that is what happens when we operate out of ego so he says faith in one's own potential you know it's going beyond your actual abilities is it is presumptuous or confidence right and um, it is best of all to submit positive affirmations to the whispered higher guidance of the soul and that is what we do when we uh, do affirmations swami ji has given us so many affirmations is based on parmansa yogananda's teachings so master always used to say that uh you know say it loud then you know we, we whisper take it more into your subconscious mind you need to plant it in your subconscious mind you need to have you know the 
because the subconscious has its own. I mean, it, the conscious mind is like a tip of the iceberg. The rest of it is all, you know, it is a repository. Everything, every impression, every thought that we have uh, is like, you know, keeping deposited into that uh, the subconscious mind from lifetimes. So it unless and until we, you know, get that into the play, we are never going to change. Okay. We are never going to change. So, um, um, so you bring the subconscious mind, but at the end of the day, uh, unless and, we are part of this higher reality. So if you, we want anything to change in a very, uh, you know, permanent way, we have to bring the super conscious aspect also into this. So we, we always, you know, gaze up at, this is the seat of the super conscious. So gaze up at the point between the eyebrows and plant the seeds of these words in the ether to bring whenever, you know, we need to uh, get that inspiration in. So, so that is what he's saying that we need to submit the positive affirmations to the whispers, whispered higher guidance of the soul, which at this point of time, he didn't know about it, right? So, um, so he was going around saying, what I say is wisdom is wisdom. And he goes on to say that it's not that my opinions were foolish. Many of them were basically sound, but you know, it wasn't, it was circumscribed in my, by my pride. It's intellectual, so I know it all. You know, that the exuberant youth, intellectual youth, um, the, the, the attitude they have, that is exactly what he was also thinking. I know it all. I, I, I have seen it all times. And in the process, even people who have had more experience than him, he would think that they should, they should listen to me and not, you know, I don't need to listen to that, which is again, uh, youthful um, pride that comes. Um, and here is where he says, that, uh, you know, intent on developing the identity I had selected for myself, I played the role for all who care to listen to me of successful author and philosopher. People would, he says, they did listen for hours. They, they, they would say, and he got his friends to talk about. So he was understanding to some extent joy. Joy is the purpose of life. Then, you know, you need to approach it through uh, non-attachment. But again, it was all coming from the, it was not rooted in anything, anything. It was just his thinking that he has come to such, certain conclusions and uh, uh, he, it is not something that he has, as he says, truth must be lived. So that is where he was lacking. He was talking from a very superficial way from what I understood, some ideas which were right, but then they didn't really uh, have any base because he was not living that. Uh, it was not coming from experience, right? So truth must be lived. And I'm afraid in endless discussion about truth, that sweet taste of it still eluded me. He didn't know what he, uh, what, I mean, he understood, even though he understood, he didn't know what exactly it means to be that. So he said, I talked when his friends said that, you know, you are a genius. He, he felt I'm a hypocrite because what I was doing is was just talk, talk, talk. Uh, it wasn't coming from anything like Saint Anthony, who people were warring between themselves about Jesus, and he walked in, and all he said was, "I have seen," and all argument stopped because he was talking from that uh, experience. He lived it, right? Um, many of our, you know, here in India, we know there's so, so many saints who never speak a word. They are Moni Babas, even Lahiri Mahashaya. Uh, they never spoke uh, much, but uh, they had that state, right? Their faith people had in them because they know they had, they lived the truth. Uh, so that is what he felt. He was also lacking at that time. It is like uh, there's a story master used to say that there was this Mahot who had this elephant and he had six sons. All of them were blind. Uh, one day he allowed them saying that, okay, you guys, uh, clean clean up the uh, elephant. So one boy was cleaning up the trunk, the other was the ears, the third was the body, the fourth one was cleaning up the legs, the fifth one was uh, cleaning up the face or something, the last one, the little one was cleaning up the tail. So after that, 
you know they are blind so they all experienced the elephant a part of that elephant so they were discussing one guy said you know it is like a long um, you know trunk of a tree the other one said no 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 it is like huge you know leaves kind of a thing so they started fighting and each one and one was doing the teeth and so each one was saying and they were you know they what they had experienced is what they were uh, fighting over soon all of them were fighting because each one was saying no no you are wrong i am right and this is how god i mean the, the elephant looks like finally the father comes and he says all of you are right and all of you are wrong and they said how is that possible if i am right how can i be wrong and he said that's because each one of you have seen only a part of the elephant i have seen the whole you no know, so i know that you know uh, that what an elephant really looks like that is what the saints or self realized master they know god so they can speak from that authority because they know it and that is where uh, that is where there are so many dogmas there are so many fights between religions between sects between uh, cults because each one understands only in this much uh, in fact uh, swami priyananda after uh, uh, paramansa yogananda uh, taken maha samadhi swami priyananda met he had come to india he met one of the saints here and he was saying oh, uh, that saint was saying something and swami priyananda said, but my guru said it this way and he said that if only uh, the disciples understood their guru uh, what the guru said rightly there wouldn't be fights between them right so that is what it is uh, each one we all have our own we are at a level of consciousness so we are able to take it from that level only this is that is what is one of the obstacle that uh, uh, patanjali says to uh, freedom that uh, we we uh, understand it from where we are at this point of time even the higher truths so only we are able to understand because my development is only this much so i will only understand from where i am i cannot per perceive something that i have no experience of so this is where it is so he talks about you know he uh goes around uh, trying to become a writer so he is constantly trying different aspects he is studying how shakespeare writes but again uh if you we want to be anything we have to tune and we have to go in and it has to come we have to go to the heart of it it has to come from the heart that is when it is like you know it, it is inspiring it makes any sense otherwise it's like just copying whatever is other other person is doing so take something from here take something from that which he says it doesn't make sense he says that my problem was how to follow shakespeare's example without sounding artificial if literary language cannot uplift there seem little point in calling it literature and if dramatic writing couldn't inspire why give back to people a mere echo of the way they spoke already so unfortunately the modern um, books call it books or the films or art that is what it is like they say that we are reflecting what you know is a, the, the 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 reality today and all do we really need to know that we already know what there are, there is something that should be uplifting we need to get up and out of this that's where he is talking about even in his writing when he was young he said that you know scholar people are i mean we, we know that the people come from the west and they go for slum tourism and all in uh, bombay i mean why why celebrate that why celebrate uh, something that is uh, the injustice of the society as he says it's a symptom of the injustice so what is needed is that you know uplift now uh, rather than beating down noble man he is saying that you know we need to uplift whatever is downtrodden rather than celebrating it at at that level that it is so this is where uh, the art or the literature of today's world is that is where it's lacking uh, that it, it it doesn't inspire and why does you know a book like new path or autobiography of a yogi why people keep reading them again and again and again or the scriptures like the you know, bhagavad gita or the uh, ramayan mahabharata because it's uplifting even one page you read it, it just uh, lifts your consciousness so that is what should, should ideally happen with any literary and swami ji is like you know finally after going through a lot of things shifting places and seeing nothing worked and then finally he said 
I don't really want even to be a writer or be called a great writer. Again, you know, he comes to the next thing saying that I don't want to be a writer. I, this is not my aim. What am I, what is the aim? Is what I was already. He is trying to go beneath that, you know, feeling the onion saying, you know, Neti, Neti, it's each uh, layer coming out. And no, I'm not this. I don't want to be a singer. I don't want to earn a lot of money. I don't want to be a writer. But he still doesn't know what he wants. So he is, you know, going through various processes um, in these chapters. And he's sure, he and they are all very inspiring for us um, that, you know, what are we, uh, if we are caught up in any of these things, you know, doing any of these things, I want to be a writer. So I'm just constantly writing something just, just to, to, you know, feel good. I'm a writer. So, you know, to, to, to feel good for the ego. Uh, so then, you know, he's giving us the, uh, the a perspective of what it ideally should be. Why should we uh, write? If if it is not something inspiring or uplifting, what's the point? So with that, it was a fairly simple chapter, but again, very thought-provoking. So we meet next week with the next chapter. So that is also a very good one, the next one also. So thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.